I'm Anthony Wright, and I'm your host today on Attunement. And today, my guest is Dr. Alan Hamilton. In the final analysis, superstitions, omens, and intuitions are the reflections of a conscious effort on the part of an individual to detect the subtle signals sent to us from the natural world. If we are convinced that the life and matter around us are mute, then we are confined to the silence of the scientifically correct. If we are open to subtlety, then the world resonates with significance. If we are convinced that the life and matter around us are mute, then we are confined to the silence of the scientifically correct. If we are open to subtlety, then the world resonates with significance. In Africa, the world is, is loud with the music of the supernatural. After beginning his working life as a janitor, Dr. Alan J. Hamilton, FACS, went on to attend Harvard Medical School and to become the Chief of Neurosurgery and Chairman of the Department of Surgery at the University of Arizona Health Sciences Center. He is currently a professor of neurosurgery and a clinical professor in the departments of radiation oncology and psychology at AHSC. Dr. Hamilton is also a script consultant for neurosurgery for the television show Grey's Anatomy. Welcome, Dr. Hamilton. Nice to be with you. Well, you have written a book called The Scalpel and the Soul, Encounters with Surgery, the Supernatural, and the Healing Power of Hope. And I know that you are, or you were, chairman of the Department of Surgery at the University of Arizona Health Sciences Center. What is a surgeon doing writing a book about the soul? Uh, they shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I certainly never started out in this career to uh, 30 years ago thinking I would ever write a book about this subject. Uh, it's just that my experiences with um, many of my patients and additively just sort of led me uh, at a certain point to look back and realize that it wasn't really the mechanistic technical mastery that had so surprised me as much as participating in, in so many patients' spiritual experiences and watching their transformations and then slowly over time, I guess it worked on me to the, to the point that I, I sort of felt like that's a pretty important part of medicine and one that I had not anticipated encountering. So you weren't prepared for this in medical school? Oh no, not at all. I was. Uh, I, I still am, in some ways, very hardcore science. I uh, I was the National Institutes of Health fellow. I made my reputation in neurosurgery and computer guidance systems uh, for surgery, um, viral gene insertion, uh, new polymer delivery systems for chemotherapy. So you're uh, very much a proponent of evidence-based medicine. Yes. And yet, there's some interesting evidence that you point out in your book. Yeah, I, I think that's part of what the book was about, is that uh, despite all of that, and despite where I thought I was going, there were a lot of experiences along the way that uh, really made me begin to question, and I think my patients taught me a lot. You have really learned a lot from your patients, more than you learned in medical school, and really it is the patient that does the healing, isn't it? I think the patient uh, has to be a participant, the idea that, of course, you could have passive healing. I mean, we have comatose patients who, uh, who heal on their own. I, th I think what I discovered was that my, how much a role my patients' emotions and spirituality could play in their recovery, how much illness often serves as a spiritual crisis and a gateway, if you will, to spiritual transformation. And just as the physician sort of participating um, to off to the side as an advocate and a partner, a lot of that began to reflect back on me. As you open your book, you're talking about uh, Amundsen's Inuit shaman. Yes. And about his experience. Talk I, to us a little I, bit I about that. I love that story. Um, I'm not sure everybody always gets it, but um, when Amundsen was uh, stuck on the ice during the winter, he, 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 had, he was forced to winter with a, uh, an encampment of Inuit uh, natives. And because he was not necessarily um, 
intimately connected with them, they, they sort of decided to put them on the edge of the village. And the edge of the village is inhabited by a number of people, but characteristically, one of the interesting roles of the shaman is that the shaman is on the edge of the village. And interestingly enough, the shaman, the witch doctor, often occupies that peripheral zone living on the cusp. And that's because the shaman is sort of, uh, has a lot of powers, magical powers, uh, is, can often be somewhat feared. So it, the decision was made that Amundsen was to, was to live with the shaman. And uh, Amundsen was with this, with this shaman, and people would come in and ask, come with various ailments or various problems, and Amundsen would sit there and watch what was going on. And after months of watching sleight of hand and this kind of thing, he, he finally couldn't stand it any longer and uh, said to this, this shaman, it, doesn't it bother you? Doesn't it drive you crazy that all of your magic is nothing? It's, it's just sleight of hand, it's smoke and mirrors. And the shaman looked at him and said, uh, that's not my magic. My magic is that I've been out on the ice and I've heard the voice of the universe and it is like a mother calling after her children. That is my magic. And I, you know, I think it just sort of puts it into context. That really is what is magical uh, in each of us. Well, and I saw that you were at Alain Barene. Yeah, right, at uh, the Albert which Schweitzer is, Hospital. Tell us about your experience in Africa. That was, in so many ways, a watershed uh, uh, episode, chapter, or multiple chapters of my life. Um, I think one of the stories that can possibly put this into context was I went to Gabon and one of our jobs at that hospital um, as temporary physicians assigned um, to the to function there was to go out into these far-flung fishing villages and immunize uh, the children with childhood vac uh, vaccinations. So for this particular job there are, no, there are no roads. What you do is you wait for the wet season and the river gets higher and then floods, and then you, all of a sudden you have all these river channels to get to the villages that you didn't have before. So we outfitted this, uh, they call it a boat, it's a little far-fetched, a dugout, I think, with an outboard on it, and we outfitted the thing and lashed everything together and um, had it all squared away and left it on the shoreline for us to depart in the morning. And during the night, the river had risen and the, uh, dugout had was was no longer there it oh, washed no. away with all your supplies yes yeah, so oh, boy. <laughs> so we went rushed down river and eventually found this dugout and uh, dragged it back but um, we obviously had to re-outfit the whole dugout and resupply it and relash everything and uh, that night I did take the precaution of uh, tying it to a truck um, <laughs> I thought that was a better anchor than the one I used the night before yeah. so we were a day late getting going and we went down the river, and because the river was so high, a lot of the landmarks that our guides would normally use um, had washed away. So the river had quite had changed its its appearance quite a bit. And we got to this very um, important fork in the river where one direction was going to take us to the villages, and the other one would take us way past them. And we couldn't tell with the way the river had split up you know, was it to the right, was it to the left, which fork, and at the very last minute we were so worried we we're going to get swept away um, that we crash landed right into the fork and somehow scampered up and uh, dragged our dugout behind us and we're very happy that we were alive and as we looked up there was this very handsome, uh, diminutive uh, African native gentleman standing there and uh, just looking at us, just and um, I, I think he must have thought these are two of the funniest looking rats that have ever washed up. But um, we uh, we spoke and, and we were where he spoke French, so and I spoke French, so we were able to communicate that uh, we were lost. And he looked on, kind of amused, and said, "Yes, I know." Um, and I said, "Well, we're trying to find this village. We don't know where this village is." And he said, "Well, that's why I'm here." But you said, just met him. Right. And I said, you mean, what do you mean that's why you're here? And he said, well, I had a dream that you were lost. And my dream told me that I should come to this fork in the river and wait for you um, to direct you to my village. 
Uh, he says, this, but the strange thing is my dream told me to be here yesterday. Now, there were no telephones or radios. There's no way he could have known that we were, we could have called ahead and said, well, hey, we're going to be a day late. <laughs> I, I was just intrigued, number one, that he had had so much faith in that dream yes. that he had gone. Number two, he had stayed for another 24 hours just mm -hmm. waiting for his, his moment to come. And of course, for me, here I was, you know, from Harvard Medical School and all of that, and suddenly the entire success of this medical mission was somehow completely bound up in the dream of a perfect stranger. And because of that dream, we were able to immunize hundreds of children. Was that the first time you, you had an encounter like that where your thought about the human capability was shifted from what you'd learned in Harvard? Well, that certainly shakes you up. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and Africa has a way of shaking you up. I mean, it, you know, it's interesting. We're so married to our faith in high tech and science. And in a way, you know, I think if somebody came down on earth, they'd, they'd say, well, you know, they have this religion. They believe everything's explainable and everything they can solve with technology. Um, in Africa, you're immersed in a culture where the supernatural is taken for granted, where folklore, legend, taboos, all of these things. We, we worked side by side with, um, with the witch doctors. It was kind of interesting that um, on the inside of the hospital, we would be taking care of the patients with Western medicine. There was an open window. The families would cook outside to hand the food in through the open window. And on the outside, there would be all the different shaman and witch doctors. And so we would basically keep going around. We'd round on the inside. The witch doctors would be going around on the outside of the building. Um, but you, you definitely are in a, in a, in a different environment and suddenly you begin to see things that make that seem to make sense logically in a way that you never would have accepted home in Boston. We went to a village on one trip and uh, we arrived at the village in, a, in the midst of a, a particular ceremony and the ceremony was to honor all of the young uh, women the young girls who had now become women. And uh, part of this ceremony was that a very special hut was constructed and it was only constructed by women. It could only be touched by women's hands. And inside this structure where they dwelled for three days, um, they uh, apparently went through a lot of instruction about uh, you know cycles and about having children about, about being a woman and what their roles were in the tribe and i was with a um a young uh, nurse who had been trained in libreville the capital and uh, had actually gone to france and was very sort of modern and very up to date and uh, there, there was a taboo about this particular hut that the women were in and that was that um, no man could touch it and no man could set foot in it, that it was sacred and only women could, could touch it. So I guess to prove a point, um, this young nurse said, you know, all of this is just su silly superstition. And, um, you know, nobody believes in this. Nobody who's got any sense believes in it. And um, he apparently... Um, he got sick a couple days later, and I, and I was kind of surprised, and he was getting more and more severely ill, and I couldn't figure out what was going on, and he was so ill, I couldn't figure out whether it was safe to transport him to the hospital. And this is a male nurse? This is a male nurse. And it, at one point, um, he suddenly admitted to me that he had, just to make a point, had stuck his foot un under the edge of this hut, and that he now realized he was becoming sick because he had broken this taboo. And he actually did go on and uh, I could not save him. And he died. And you know, you sort of say to yourself, well, you know, is that just coincidence? Uh, you know, but you, when you're immersed in that kind of environment and you begin to see how these forces can actually start to work, it really makes you question how we go through in the Western world, oblivious to it, if, as it were. I mean, not everybody, but a lot of us. Uh, it's just sort of say, this has no role in my life kind of thing. Well, I think actually we're subject to much more than we realize. Would you, would you say that that man's experience 
uh, had anything to do with what he came to believe, or was it more an interaction that he had with a field around that hut? I, I, you know, I, I don't know if there is a field around the hut. You know, there's a lot of work being done on biofield and uh, those fields of energy, and obviously there's a lot of physics about that that's starting to come out. I'm more intrigued by the fact that uh, we all have no problem accepting, this was well studied um, in the early 20th century, that people who are in a culture uh, where voodoo is prevalent, and if they have beliefs in voodoo, um, if a witch doctor places a curse on them, then we know that perfectly healthy people will suddenly succumb to illness and be quite ill. But that's, is that a <clears throat> state of hypnosis or? You know, uh, I, I don't have an answer for it. What's interesting is if the curse is lifted, they, they will recover very quickly. Um, if the curse isn't lifted, they will go on and die. I don't think we have much question about that. Um, uh, it, it used to have the term malignant sympathetic activation. It was an old term. But what it really meant was that, in essence, the patient's internal chemical state led to one of complete depletion that then led to collapse. Um, we know that that can happen. We know people can die of fright. We know people can die of uh, extensive stress. Um, well, the reason that intrigues me so much is if we accept that people can literally die because of their beliefs, then why do we have such a hard time believing that people can live because, because of, them? of their beliefs? Yeah. Right. We're going to have to take a short break. I'm Anthony Wright, and I'm your host today on Attunement, and we are talking with my guest, neurosurgeon Dr. Alan Hamilton. And how can people contact you, Dr. Hamilton? Uh, the easiest way is through my website, which is alanhamilton.com, A-L-L-A-N, Hamilton. Great. All right, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. I'm Anthony Wright, and I'm your host today on Attunement, and we're talking with my guest, neurosurgeon Dr. Alan Hamilton. And before the break, we were talking about your experiences in Africa and about how belief influences physiology. In your book, you talked about the influence of the supernatural in OR. You talked about that you yourself came across three buzzards shredding a jackrabbit. Tell us about that story. I, I think this was probably a residue from some of my experiences in Africa. Uh -huh. um, I was driving to work uh, early in the morning, and on the road there side, there had been a rabbit, a jackrabbit that had been run over and was roadkill, and there were three buzzards that were just shredding the carcass. And I, dr I drove in, I live in the desert in Tucson, Arizona, and I was driving in and took note of the scene and uh, kept driving to the hospital. Um, as is my routine, we were getting to start the operative day and getting our patients ready to go to the OR, and we have an area where the patients are getting ready and having intravenous lines put in and so on. That's called the holding area. And I went to see this patient in the holding area and just, um, you know, say good morning. And his wife was there. And I said, you know, everything's ready and we'll see you back in the operating room in a few minutes. And I went to leave and they're getting ready to wheel him out. And his wife leans over and says, um, I love you, bunny. Don't worry. Everything will be all right. You're my little bunny. And it was that word bunny that just hit me like a hammer and I'm going bunny. And then I was thinking of the rabbit and it really struck me as an odd coincidence. And, and especially because the image of that rabbit and the buzzards was what immediately sounded after she said those words bunny. So I didn't know what to do. Uh, but I reacted to it you know, on a gut level. I went out to the front desk where we have the, uh, the big board where we schedule all the operations, and there was a nurse there I knew, and I said, you know, look, don't really ask me why or how. Just I want you to take this gentleman that I've got on schedule as our first case, and I want you to delay him. And she looked at me, and I said, I'll go talk to the family and make sure they, that they, they're okay with that, but I'd like you to bump him back later in the day in the schedule. So I went to see him, and of course I didn't say, hey, I've got this weird omen or right. something. But I said, look, there's just been some changes, and we gotta move one patient up in front of you, and we'll take you later. Um, so it just turned out that in the next couple of hours, this man had a heart attack. And had we taken him to the operating room, he would have been in the midst of brain surgery under anesthesia. We would have had a very difficult time managing a heart attack under those conditions. Um, 
as it was, he was right there. He was monitored. He went right up to the CC, the U, the coronary care unit. He did beautifully. Um, I thank my lucky stars that I had paid attention to those buzzards. But again, you say to yourself, what is that? Is that the, it, you know, is the universe sending us little signals and we, we don't necessarily pick up on them? Well, and I'd like to ask you to read a section of your book, page 28, that I've got outlined right there. In the final analysis, superstitions, omens, and intuitions are the reflections of a conscious effort on the part of an individual to detect the subtle signals sent to us from the natural world. If we are convinced that the life and matter around us are mute, then we are confined to the silence of the scientifically correct. If we are open to subtlety, then the world resonates with significance. Now that, to me, really has a deep resonance. And you, from your training, your internship in Africa, became open to that awareness. Yeah. I think that was one of the things I was trying to allude to in, uh, about Africa, that it, it was as if in Africa the world is, is loud with the music of the supernatural. And it's an ability, how, but as Westerners, how do we begin to learn to attend to that music? The, the um, image that, that I use over and over again is um, my amazement when I look at photographers. We can walk together, you and I, in a landscape, on a hike, and we see everything. But then if the guy down the trail happens to be Ansel Adams with a, photo, with a camera, all of a sudden he's looking at the same landscape that we have, but he somehow frames it in a different context. And all of a sudden the magic and the power that were there are, 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 th are suddenly apparent where you and I walked right past it and just drank it in but didn't see that. I think in some ways that... Um, is why we encounter certain individuals who seem to have a special proclivity, and I'm, I'm not one of them, I'm not saying that, but we all have encountered special individuals who just seem to be in touch in a way um, that we're not. A friend of mine who took care of a lot of Native Americans on the, on the Navajo and Hopi reservations was, was talking to me once about um, the, the issue of death amongst Native Americans and that there's much less fear and there's much more of an acceptance and a, 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 a sort of grace that, that, that they have about the whole thing. And he said, it's as if they're in on something that we Anglos don't get. And they have a sensitivity, if you will, from the time they're born, they're taught about the fact that life is flowing through everything, that everything is speaking to them, that a bird uh, circling in the sky uh, can be an, a signal, that, a, that um, you know, footprints of a, of, a, of a mouse creeping by at the campsite is a signal. And I think that in some ways that what we need to do is sort of turn the sensitivity, turn the, the, the volume up so that we're hearing a little bit better those signals. Well, this is an, a willingness to attend to something that's outside of our normal cultural awareness here in the West. I, I think so, and I think part of the cultural awareness in the West is almost trying to make you deaf to everything else. Um, in a way, we insist that we have rational explanations for everything. Um, and when we don't, um, we get very nervous. And I can tell you that in, in writing this book, a lot of my colleagues, but particularly the ones in surgery, surgery is a very, very conservative discipline. Um, they'd all be right-wing Republicans in terms of their... It's real hardcore evidentiary science. It is, and it's very mechanistic. It's, you know, you go in and you fix things and it's technique and... But you're still dealing with living cells, and those cells have an energy to them. Um, you know, that, I think that's an, a fascinating perspective that you have. In a way, listening to those cells, paying attention to those cells, um, understanding that uh, almost like the hiker who says, um, I'll leave nothing but footprints and take only memories. The idea is you can have a very natural, sensitive attitude towards that 
for me, that brain tissue, and think, you know what, I have to have so much respect for what's going on here, I will disturb things as little as possible. That's one of the reasons I was drawn to computer guidance systems in neurosurgery is they allow me to go through um, the brain with as little disturbance as possible to get to where the pathology is. So, so yes, I think that's a, a very interesting point that you brought up. It doesn't, the two don't have to be irreconcilable. Because I had done an interview with Dr. Bruce Lipton, and you may have seen yes. some of his work, and, and one of the things that a question pops into my mind, do you, as a surgeon uh, or surgeons, are, are you now coming to uh, embrace a communication from the cells to find out what did those cells want? Because you've done some of this in terms of tracking down uh, the, the, the particular brain tumors that you have. I think dealing with brain tumors makes you realize that different cells uh, behave differently and we tend to give them a label. Um, it's sort of like saying, you know, spruce tree. It, it really depends on the relationship you have with that spruce tree. I had a very interesting experience that I think gets a little bit at your question. We were doing an, an experiment with, um, actually I was doing the experiment with Andy Weil, who's one of the gurus of alternative medicine. Mm -hmm. And Andy was kind enough to write the foreword to my book here. But uh, we were growing lots of tumor cell lines in the lab and growing them in culture dishes. Um, and one of the things that we knew is we, we could grow these cells reproducibly over and over and over again and we could count these cells by the millions and figure out their growth curves. So we came up with this experiment which is we took these rat tumor cell lines, very reliable, absolutely considered the bedrock of investigation in cancer for brain tumors, and we grew them on these plates. And one set of plates, they just stayed in the incubator, they never were touched. Another set of plates we put between the hands of a healer a very well-established healer, very reputable. And the third group of plates we put between the hands of the lab technician for exactly the same amount of time that the healer held the plates between her and hands. And the lab technician had no special orientation? No, it, or... was, it was just on the off chance that maybe taking the plates out of the incubator and holding them between hands somehow changed temperatures and that was what the effect was. Uh, the interesting thing is none of the tumor cell lines, the one that we left alone in the incubator and the one that were held by the lab technician, stopped growing. Their growth curves just kept continuing day after day. But the cell plates that were held between the hands of the healers uh, suddenly stopped and peaked and did no longer continue. And there's two interesting parts of the story, but the first is coming back to your main point. When I asked the healer if she would do this experiment, she was very hesitant. And I was taken kind of aback because, you know, you had me as the head of surgery and you had Andy Weil, yeah. two pretty reputable docs, I like to think, and yeah. I thought you would enjoy working with us and investigating. And she said, I just think the idea of sending energy out into, with the intent of destroying cells is a difficult concept for me to, um, to grapple with. And she finally decided to go ahead and do this. Now, the, the other interesting part of this story is we ran what's called a microarray, which is a way of looking very, very, in a very sophisticated way, very precisely at what genes are affected. And, oh, sure. and what we found was that there were about 20 genes that were turned on or off in the group of cells that the healer had held between her hands, and that many of these genes controlled cell cycle. So it raised a very perplexing question, which is, could there be genes <laughs> in our genetic makeup, in our chromosomes, that actually can be affected um, by healing energies uh, we certainly know uh, that emotions uh, have profound effects on neurochemicals, but could it even be that genes have an effect? I don't know. Um, I do know that we, we did this experiment four different times uh, in the lab just to make sure it was not an error. Uh, 
um, and uh, it wasn't. Well, we're going to have to take a short break. I'm Anthony Wright. Uh, I'm your host today on Attunement, and we're talking with my guest, uh, neurosurgeon Dr. Alan Hamilton. And how can people contact you, Dr. Hamilton? Again, at my website, alanhamilton.com, A-L-L-A-N-H-A-M-I-L-T-O-N.com. Great. We're going to take a short break, and we're going to be right back, so stay tuned. I'm Anthony Wright, and I'm your host today on Attunement, and we're talking with my guest, neurosurgeon Dr. Alan Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton, before the break, we were talking about rat stem cell lines that were held between the hands of a healer in a controlled experiment that you were doing. Are you familiar with the work of Ernest Rossi, the psychobiology of gene expression? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about what you understand from, from that work? Well, I think some of the more interesting energetic biofield work will come out of systems like uh, what Rossi's using. Very often these are bacterial cell lines. Mm -hmm. the, the reason is we don't typically think of bacteria as necessarily being cognizant, conscious human beings, but I think they're not systems that we're used to uh, thinking that people could easily tamper with just by their emotional state and that kind of thing. Um, we're finding in some situations there are suggestions that perhaps we can actually select for a particular subspecies of E. coli bacteria. There are by several- By emotional intention. By emotional intention. Now, most of the people that the experiments have been done with are obviously very finely tuned individuals who are Reiki therapists or energetic healers. These are people who have spent years and years refining their art. But still, to see something like a, a, a Reiki therapist, for example, being able to select for a subgroup of E. coli and showing that there's a higher incidence of uh, the sub coli type that the Reiki therapist was selecting for, it just raises some very, very interesting questions about just how alive and interconnected is the universe right down to perhaps the cellular level. Well, there's implications of, of being able to then um, have a, I, I imagine, I mean, I don't want to get too far out in the skinny branches here, but to have an intentional capability of microsurgery that was uh, undreamed of. Well, a, n a number of uh, cancer patients use image-guided therapy. Um, as a way of uh, um, directing, as you will, their internal resources towards uh, cancer um, therapy. And, and, and part of this is, the, is often visualizing the, the killer T cells um, going after the cancer and, and killing it. Well, we know that killer T cells have receptors on them that specifically monitor the neurochemicals that are put out by our brain. Yeah, Candace when, Pert talks a lot about that. Exactly. So suddenly we have this intimate uh, psychoneuroimmunologic connection. Uh, there's interesting work that shows it's not just human beings who respond to this, uh, that animals respond to this. There are, um, which, which to me begins to raise the whole question that the universe may work in very, very different complex patterns that we have vastly underestimated. Well, in fact, that we are one of the things uh, that we're a colony of 50 trillion cells. I found that to be really quite remarkable that are all working toward a purpose as a, as a, as a human being. Uh, and, uh, and that all of Every, that all life forms could be totally interconnected in ways that we don't understand. Um, Schweitzer, going back to Africa um, for a moment, Schweitzer raised, uh, had this, this doctrine of respect for life, and that was for, um, in part, I mean, his work in that area was what won him the Nobel Peace Prize. And Schweitzer raised the question as a doctor, if we have respect for all life, what do we do when a patient comes in with pneumonia with bacteria that are flourishing in their lobe of their lungs. Um, and uh, you know, where does the respect for life draw the line? Now, in medicine, we rarely ask ourselves any kind of questions like that. It's just, I think it begins to 
come back to this overall question of how do we really understand all of the um, the energy that's put out by all of the different life forms. It really brings me then to what the emotional component of the auto, autoimmune diseases may be. That, that's a, that's a tough question to answer. There are plenty of patients who suffer with autoimmune disorders who will tell you that periods of stress, particularly periods of emotional stress, will be when they'll see their flare-ups. And this is across the yep, spectrum. Across the board. On the, alt, on the opposite side of the coin, you'll also talk to people who'll say, when I do my meditation, when I'm listening to my image-guided therapy, when I've got my life in order organized so I'm centered, my autoimmune disease is under control. Um, so I think s almost every aspect of disease will have some emotional uh, slash spiritual component. And this is a whole nother level of evidence-based medicine, isn't it? Yes. Well, I mean, that's certainly how I approach it. I, I, I mean, the reason I wrote this book was more nothing in my background as a medical student, as a resident, and later, you know, as a, as a chairman of Department of Surgery, nothing had really prepared me for how much I was going to be confronted by spiritual and emotional issues and the depth of these issues. And not just that my patients were going to be going through these transformations, it was going to start to challenge me on a very profound level. And I, I wanted that discussion to start to take place. I wanted to open up a dialogue about that. Well, we're going to have to take a short break. I'm Anthony Wright. I'm your host today on Attunement, and we're talking with my guest neurosurgeon, Dr. Alan Hamilton. And how can people contact you, Dr. Hamilton? Um, at alanhamilton.com, uh, A-L-L-A-N-H-A-M-I-L-T-O-N.com. Great. Well, we're going to take a short break, and we will be right back. I'm Anthony Wright, and I'm your host today on Attunement, and we are talking with my guest neurosurgeon, Dr. Alan Hamilton. You were talking about, before the break, how this whole exploration as a surgeon, as a mindful medical practitioner, had led you to areas you hadn't expected. One thing I did want to ask you about before we go into your personal experience was a personal experience you have, and perhaps you continue to have this capability of being able to see death. Um, I, I sort of have to caution you. It's not that I can see death. I, I, when I, I started off working uh, in, as a janitor, actually, <laughs> and uh, I, I got a part-time job working for a veterinary surgeon. And one of the things that, uh, unfortunately, you have to have uh, to, uh, the capability of doing in a veterinary practice is um, a lot of animals get put to sleep who are in terminal or intractable pain. And I noticed as we were putting the animals to sleep, I would help him hold the animals uh, as we were putting them to sleep. And I would notice this very strange kind of yellowish, almost reflected candlelight, like you sort of see in some of the, the old masters, the Rembrandts, where there's a reflected light. I'd see that kind of golden light close in on the dogs as, uh, they, as they died. And I really didn't think very much of it uh, after, you know, that I just uh, kind of wrote it off and went on my merry way. And then when I was a medical student and we'd be walking around in the uh, ICUs and stuff, every once in a while I'd see an individual that would seem to have this yellowish light around them again. And, and sure enough, these would be people who were in extremis and very close to dying. Um, now, it's not that I walk around the hospital and say, well, let's see who's going to die today. That isn't what happens, and it certainly doesn't happen with everyone. Um, but what I've noticed is with uh, some people, when they're close to death, there's this kind of yellowish, waxy kind of light that closes in around them. And then if they uh, recover and they, they pull away, the light disappears. Um, but as they move into death, the light coalesces around them. And it, it interestingly reminded me a lot of the descriptions that um, I had read from Carlos Castaneda about individuals being these fibers of light and so on. He writes, when they are seen as fields of energy, human beings appear to be like fibers of light, like white cobwebs, very fine threads that circulate from the head to the toes. Thus, to the eye of a seer, a man 
looks like an egg of circulating fibers and his arms and legs are like luminous bristles bursting out in all directions. So that's what you were, you were beginning, you had discovered you were beginning to attend to. Well, I, I don't know that I was, you know, I don't know that I'm in the same field as Don Juan, but when I read that description, it sounded to me, and he goes on to talk with his apprentice, Carlos, about the fact that when people die, these, these fibers start to disassemble, and the light begins to disassemble, and I wondered, it sounded very much like the kind of fading light that I would see around the individual. So, um, it, it, and there's, I have to say, there's been a couple of times, a handful of times where I've walked into a room and seen a patient with that light starting to coalesce and said, okay, that person's going back to the ICU and we'll order a CT scan. And of course, it makes you look like a genius, but it's really just following your intuition. Well, and yet that, again, is another level of evidence-based medicine that perhaps uh, our medical profession certainly could use to at least open to the possibility of it. Well, the, you know, I'm sure it, you're not the only surgeon that's no, had these experiences. And, and, and that's the thing is you talk to you talk to surgeons, you talk to nurses, and you say, have you seen things miraculous and supernatural and things that you can't explain? And we've all had the sense of a presence of a departed loved one who's been with us. We all have those. And and you know when you talk to people in healthcare, they go yes. And um, I even had one surgeon the other day come up to me and. Um, I was a little, a little disturbed about the book coming out and said, you know, I can't believe that you, you uh, as a chairman of surgery and what you've done in surgery, it's that very you're, risky. you're talking about this. And yeah. uh, I said, well, you know, I, I, I can understand that you feel that way. He says, very matter-of-factly, on the other hand, I can always tell when something bad is happening with my children. I have this sixth sense long before they phone. And I, I just sort of shrugged my shoulders and said, okay, there. Um, I think this happens every single day in every hospital in the country, um, and I think it's we've we've we're nervous, we're uncomfortable about talking about it, um, but I I think we should open up a dialogue, and our patients certainly are coming in with the expectation that they are going to use all of their emotional and spiritual resources to accelerate their recovery. And so, can you talk about the role of alternative and complementary medicine? I'm a very big proponent of alternative and complementary medicine because everything in medicine that is now dogma started off once as alternative medicine. I think you give the example of um, the man, um, Ignaz Philip uh, Semmelweis. Semmelweis. Semmelweis is considered the patron saint of uh, motherhood. Uh, Semmelweis had this absolutely radical alternative idea. Women were dying by the millions of what was called puerperal fever, which was childbirth fever. Um, Semmelweis had noticed that there seemed to be more women dying in the wards where the medical students were going down to the autopsy room and coming up. And he had this theory, which was if they washed their hands and dipped them in a chlorinated bleach solution to make them clean, that he could reduce uh, the, the incidence of puerperal fever. Um, the result was he was banned by the medical community. They refused to let any medical students uh, go on his service. What year was this? This was in the 18th century, 19th century. I'm sorry, let me go back. It's in the 19th century. Uh, that was in the 19th century. Now, interestingly enough, Semmelweis was undeterred. He actually kept very, very careful statistics and showed that there was a sevenfold reduction in, in the number of women who were dying. And in fact, he went, it was unheard of, he went for a period of three months without a single woman dying of childbirth fever in his ward. The, the Vienna medical community was so outraged by his continued insistence that they threw him out. Um, from there, he had to leave Vienna. He went on to three other hospitals and demonstrated three more times that he could stop puerperal fever by washing hands. Um, he was laughed out of the community. In fact, he died uh, in an insane asylum and actually died of an infection in his hands from puerperal fever. Um, now, nobody would question washing your hands. So I always talk to my colleagues and say, how can you be so close-minded about alternative medicine when you've seen not just the role of serendipity throughout the history of medicine, but when you've seen over and over and over again that it was alternative ideas were so 
uh, vociferously fought off, and and uh, these people were thrown out and badmouthed and kicked out. Um, the same thing happened with peptic ulcer disease. People 30 years ago said it was stress, it was spicy food. You know, it came out of nowhere the idea that it was could be bacteria, but it said you're crazy. They were, they were booed off stage when they would present at national uh, scientific symposia. So alternative medicine, you have to have an open mind about it, or you can't really say that you're functioning as a credible scientist in my mind. But nonetheless, it, it is important to do uh, good science with these alternative methods. Absolutely, and you can uh, you can be helped with alternative medicine. Uh, you can be hurt. I had a patient of mine who um, I had very specifically queried about what medications she was taking. She gave me the list. Everything was fine. I got some laboratory results back that showed her her coagulation parameters, her clotting abilities were off by by several fold. I said, "Is there something you know that you haven't been telling me?" And it turned out she was taking a very very large amount of garlic. Now, garlic's a wonderful anticoagulant. It's great. The, the problem is, had I not looked at that lab test and said, geez, I think something else is going on, we better go back and track it. So alternative medicine, you need to be upfront about what you're doing in terms of alternative therapies. A number of them are now proving to be to work very effectively. Others don't, and we, we drop them by the roadside. One of the things that fascinated me was an ability that you talk about in the book about your ability to pre-visualize surgery. And I believe this was also uh, an attribute that the inventor Nikola Tesla had. But tell us about what your experience of pre-visualizing surgeries offers you. I, ha um, every morning before I do an operation, what I do is I actually spend uh, time, I, I do it in the shower. I don't, it's just when I know I'm gonna have some time where I can focus. And what I do is I actually walk through the entire procedure and see it in my mind. And it, in my mind, it's happening in slow motion. I see all the instruments that I'm going to be laying out. I see the images of where I'm going to be operating. I see the incision. I see the exposure. I can see what I'm going to see through the microscope. And it's as if I'm rehearsing um, in my mind visually what I'm going to see. It's interesting that with advanced uh, computer graphics I've spent a lot of my life actually trying to develop the ability for people to look in 3D before surgery and plan their surgery that way. The, the nice thing is that for me when I visualize surgery like that I often will have anticipated problems in the pre-surgical visualization that helped me be, when I get to surgery, that had I not run through that exercise, um, I wouldn't have anticipated some of the, the physical uh, problems I'm, I was going to encounter during the surgery. In terms of the ductility of the cell walls and the tools that you need to have immediately at hand to deal with things that would seem to be spontaneous. Exactly, or even particular moves, uh, you'll be able to visualize, okay, I'm going to be reaching next to this particular artery, and I'm going to want this particular instrument at that moment, and just visualizing it allows me to know what the instrument is that I'm going to ask for, but also to look on the table and make sure it's, they're all laid out the way I want them to. And yet, there, there are aircraft pilots who talk about situational awareness, about what is going on in the space around them. As a competent surgeon, I'm sure you've developed that to a remarkable degree. Yes, and at the same time when you're doing surgery, you're so focused on what's going on between um, your eyes and your hands um, that, I, that I've described it very much as a flow state. Um, that uh, it's, it's like a, a musician or an athlete. Um, you're suddenly in this situation where everything seems to be happening perfectly, there's a perfect meshing of your manual dexterity with what the tissues are demanding. And uh, you just, time seems to stand still. I mean, the operating room is really an operating theater. It's a place of drama. And you look up and hours have flown by on the clock and you look around you and there've already been a shift change and, and multiple nurses and technicians have changed. Um, but you've been really so focused on that, uh, in that flow state of what's happening with your hands that you've been oblivious to that. Well, and, it's, and you just said what the tissues are demanding. So you are attending really at a, a very deep level about what the tissue seems to want. Great surgeons, the best surgeons that I've trained with, um, uh, 
were masters at respecting tissue. And people used to wonder why their infection rates were so low and why their incisions healed and why their patients did so well. And the, the trick I found that, was, that they were using was just an unbelievable respect for the integrity of tissues and trying to disturb things as little as possible as they get, got the job done. And, and trying to leave things in as pristine a state as they could. Right, and yet do you find that you have intuitions in the moment that you trust that intuition to do something that you hadn't expected and find out that it was appropriate? I uh, remember one specific instance which I, I didn't put in my book, but um, I was helping a, a surgeon who was a very accomplished surgeon and had a very good national reputation and uh, he was more senior than I so he, I was sort of letting him do uh, a lot of the surgery. It was his patient and I was assisting him and um, at one point uh, there was a, a, a particular vessel that we were dissecting and I just heard a voice in my head say, um, I wouldn't do that. And <laughs> just at that moment, um, he reached behind and um, and tore that little small vessel, and uh, I swore after that day we fixed it and find the patient did perfectly well. But I swore after that day if I heard that little voice go, I wouldn't do that. I was just going to say I wouldn't do that. Um, so there are things I think where a lot of surgery is intuitive about what the tissues will allow you to get away with where your moves are safe, where the moves are unsafe. Um, the other thing is where to stop. Uh, sometimes you've got to be able to say, you know, um, this is where I've, the surgery can't go any farther without the patient incurring an unacceptable risk. Um, and I and think that's the, also a, a degree of situational awareness you've gained by experience. And I think also, I, I personally, I pray that before I start each operation that I will uh, first have uh, guidance and help, um, but also that if there come difficult decisions that I will make them uh, as if they were being made on myself, that I'll make them with the absolute best of intentions um, and out of, uh, out of uh, love for that patient and their life. I'm so sorry to say we are out of time. This has gone way too fast. Thank you for being with us, and oh. um, I hope to be able to talk with you again. Well, it's been my pleasure. It's been wonderful having a chance to, to uh, talk like this and share things together. Well, I'm Anthony Wright, and I'm your host today on Attunement, and we're talking with my guest, neurosurgeon Dr. Alan Hamilton. And how can people contact you, Dr. Hamilton? Again, uh, alanhamilton.com, A-L-L-A-N-H-A-M-I-L-T-O-N. Thank you so much for being with us, and we will see you next time. I'm Anthony Wright, and I've been your host today on Attunement. Please go to my website, attunement.biz, A-T-T-U-N-E-M-E-N-T dot biz, B-I-Z, if you'd like to listen to more lectures from this show. Thanks again for listening, and see you next time.